Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday School lesson, Kingdom Lives Matter. If you're watching us live on GRTV, welcome. Thank you. Uh, if you found us brand new uh, to our, on, on our YouTube channel, I would like to say thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you would, please make sure you subscribe uh, and hit the notification bell. That way you'll get notified when we upload a new video. Uh, typically, we do two videos every week, uh, the UGP, Union Gospel Press, and the International Standard Gospel Commentary, International Standard Commentary. Uh, there's a couple of different, a uh, few different publications out on the uh, Standard International Lessons Series. This one is the Townsend Press. Uh, this one is a really nice publication. I enjoy this one as well. And then there's another one called the Standard Lesson. Uh, they both are very good uh, publications if, you want, if you're looking for something for your Sunday school class. Now, uh, this lesson, as you can see, is called Consequences for Injustice. Consequences for Injustice. Now, this, I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you, this King James Version here in Habakkuk, uh, it took me a while to get this broken down. There's some hard language in here. Um, but let's go ahead and dive into it. I'll go ahead and read the text. The nice thing is that there's only goes from six to 14. So we got eight verses that we're going to break down and dissect for you. So stay to the end. Uh, we won't be long. We're not going to tarry long. I promise you that. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increases that which is not his. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that they shall vex thee, and thou shalt be the booties up unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's bloodshed, and for the violence of the land, and of the city, and of those that dwell therein, woe, that's the second woe, woe to him that coveteth an evil, covetousness to his house, that, me, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people. And thou hast sinned against thy soul. For the, soul. for the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Here's the third woe. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establish a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts, that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves with very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen, amen. Now I'm going to tell you what I had to do. Now, I've been studying this word all my life, uh, but typically what I would do is I'll read different versions when I break, uh, get ready to study a lesson. Uh, not just reading to be reading. Typically, I'm going to read different. And I don't, very rarely do I just read to read. Like maybe the Psalms, I'll read it, or Proverbs, I'll read, you know, to get some inspiration. Um, but generally, when I read a text, I want to go and read different versions. Okay, this book has the NIV laying right next to it. Uh, it's a parallel. But then I also, I like going into the uh, NASV or the, um, the Message. You know, Peterson's work is beautiful, and that really, really breaks it down. Now, here in uh, this Townsend Press, they go and they give you uh, age-level points to be emphasized. You got teachers of youth and adults, you got points here for that. Teachers of children, they give you a geographical and cultural setting for the lesson and a chronological setting for the lesson. Uh, they go on to talk about the uh, prominent... Uh, characters in the lesson as well, and key terms. So this is a really very nice publication. It comes with the introduction, another biblical background, 
And then the outline. You got four steps here. Uh, first step is uh, part of verse 6, 6a. They call it 6a. Confirmation of God's coming judgment. Um, B, the second step is woe to the greedy, right? Habakkuk 2, 6b through 8. Now, in this section, there's three woes, but in this whole dialogue uh, that God is giving Habakkuk, there's actually five woes. Each one of these stanzas, it's a poem. God has given a poetic, uh, poetic writing here, and so in each stanza, there's three verses. So you have 6, 7, 8, that would be woe to the greedy. Then you have 9, 10, 11, woe to those who commit acts of injustice. And then the third one is woe to those who profit from acts of violence. That's 12, 13, and 14. Okay? And God is just wonderful, man. This, when you get into the Word and you start breaking this down and you can see how God is putting this together, it's like, wow. This is some beautiful writing. This is some, I mean, it's like great. Now, the first chapter of Habakkuk finds the prophet inquiring of God, right? Habakkuk is talking to God. Now, this is unusual. Most times, prophets are relaying a message from God. Most times, God is speaking through the prophet to the people. But here in chapter 1, the prophet is inquiring of God, and he wants to know. He, he questions God's wisdom, in fact. He wants to know, how long will God allow this great sin of Judah to continue in the land? Mm, mm, mm. He's questioning God. He knows that God will punish all sin, but seemingly, God is silent and continues to allow sin to perpetuate. Right? Get traction and continue like a tire going downhill. It perpetuates itself. The energy keeps it rolling. And that's what's been happening with the sin. The sin is being perpetuated uh, within the southern region of the promised land. Now, this, not, this does not seem logical. It's not logical to human nature that the children of Israel, God's chosen people, would be allowed to continue in sin without regards to God's covenant. I mean, come on. The people complained to Moses about food, and God struck them with fire. Boom! The people could complain about food and wire. God sent fiery snakes, right? I mean, he was swift and quick with a lot of the punishment. Here, here, and of course you know that the prophet Rebecca knows the word of God. He's read the Pentateuch several, several times. So he knows about what's been going on in the Exodus. He knows about the sin and the punishment, the flood and so on. So he's like, God, why are you taking so long? This law, the covenant, the covenant that God made with his people, right? They have broken it, right? And God promised them. He promised them that he was going to come with a rod of a strong, wicked nation to punish them, right? This law has become dead to the children of Israel. The law has become numb to them. They are doing what was, uh, they were doing whatever their mind could conceive. Now God, he goes in and he answers Habakkuk, and he lets them know, that he is raising up a more wicked nation in the form of the Babylonians, right? Or, or Chaldeans, those terms are synonymous. The Babylonians, Chaldeans, these, they are the current world dominant power, right? These folks are to come with the rod and take the people of God like creepy things upon the earth, the Bible says in verse two. Chapter two, I believe it says. Oh, it's in chapter one, chapter one. God's going to bring in, bring in uh, Babylon, and they're going to swoop these people up like creepy things on the earth. You know, like, like, you know, like little bugs roaming around on the earth, how you big and grown, looking like a giant, how you could just step on them and crush them. That's how Babylon is going to do his people. God said he's going to, like a fish in the sea, they're going to be swallowed up. It's like a school of little, little fish, right? And here comes a big killer whale and just swoops them up. Wow! 
right? You know, or a fisherman who was out there fishing, like, you know, when God called his apostles, Peter, James, and John, and they were fishing, and he told them to cast their nets on the other side, and the nets swallowed up all those fish. That's how the Chaldeans are going to appear to the children of Israel. God says, like grains of sand, they're going to be blown with the wind, like a nation with no ruler. You know what I mean? So imagine this wind coming and just blowing the sand. That's how Babylon is going to do. They are on its way as the instrument or the rod of God to kill and imprison God's chosen nation. Woo! Lord, Lord, thank you for Jesus, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, my Savior. Now, Habakkuk is no doubt perplexed that God would use a more wicked nation who were experts at war, right? They were experts at getting money by illegal ways, treating people with no regard to human life. But God, brothers and sisters, God lets the prophet know that he will have mercy on his people, right? And the Chaldeans will face extreme judgment. God will use a wicked nation to turn his people back toward himself. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I've had God use some wickedness. I've had God use some bad things to capture my attention and turn me back to himself. Wow. And then, check this out. Ooh, God is so just. He's so righteous. He promised that he's going to rebuke the very rod. He's going to rebuke the very instrument that he has chosen to slay his own people. Jesus, help me. Mm, mm, mm. It's, like, it's like having a bully in the neighborhood, and your mama said, go get the bully, and, and go find a switch, and tell that bully to whoop you. Huh? Yeah. That's what's going on here. In this lesson, in this lesson, the oppressed people are comforted because God has predestined judgment. Mm. Wow. Now there are three woes, three woes or warnings or prophetic judgment. These are categorized as taunt songs. Most theologians use this word taunt, taunt song to the oppressor. You know, so, so it's kind of like the oppressed the oppressed, the slaves, the ones that are, are downtrodden on, they know the prophecy says that God is going to take the oppressor out. So it's like, it's almost like a taunt, like, woe, woe unto you. <laughs> right? Now, the first woe in verse 6 represents uh, verses 6 through 8, right? We talked about that. The second, wo the second woe represents verses 9 through 11. And then the third, row, the third woe represents verses 12 through 14. Now, each one of these woes uh, has three verses each, and the total woe passage is made up of about five stanzas total, representing five different classes of evildoers. Now, in this lesson, we're only going to deal with three different classes, right? Uh, in verse 6, verse 6, the first woe, it says, Shall not these take up a parable against him, and I, and a taunting proverb against him, saying, Woe to him that increases that, that which is not his. Okay? This first woe charges extortion, the plundering of God's nation. They were a great threat. Uh, uh, they were under great threat and bodily harm uh, for the purpose, the sole purpose of Babylon getting even more rich, right? This was Babylon's thinking. Now God's purpose was for a whole nother thing, get his people out of sin and get them back to himself. But Babylon had in mind, they going in and plunder these people because of their evil intent uh, God is using them as his rod. God will use the remnant, the people left over after Babylon comes and take these people out. God's going to use the remnant, uh, the people that survive, to plunder the Chaldeans. What? You got this massive group of people, the Babylons come in and boom, wipe out, 
and then there's just a handful of them left, per se, and God's going to use them to take out this great, dominant world power. Jesus. Come on now, who else can do that? <laughs> now, just take up a parable business. Take up a parable at the top of verse 6. Initially, Bob Babylon will be the apparent victor, right? But God is announcing that they will be extinct, right? And turn into nothing more than a parable, a story told to describe a kingdom principle. Many pledges, many pledges. Uh, when you see many pledges, what you think of here is uh, the Babylonians exercise extreme uh, taxation on the conquered nation. They made loans with excessive interest. You know, it's kind of like these payday loans, you know, excessive interest. You know, do not do the payday loans, brothers and sisters. If you don't know, you know now. Do not do that. Uh, then uh, we talk about this thick clay. Thick clay. Uh, that's down in uh, verse 6b, right? This is not a reference to soil but it refers to a heavy pledge or a heavy weight, like the world power induces upon its defeated enemies, right? They put a heavy weight on them. Heavy power is put on them. God uses this analogy because the Chaldeans systematically stole the coffins and graves for their own. Imagine that. Now God says the same thing you did to my people, I, I will repay with the heavy weight that you will not be able to withstand. Amen, somebody. Uh, let's look at verse 7 here. Verse 7. It says, Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that they shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them. Bite, bite, bite. The Chaldeans have bitten the people. They paralyzed them, carried away God's people. They carried away God's people's wealth, their money, their resources, their gold, their silver, their animals, their livestock, carried it away. Children made slaves out of them, child labor. But thank God Almighty that he has a plan. Ha! <laughs> I'm thanking God for the plan in my life. David Rhodes, thank you, God, for the plan in my life. You didn't give up on me. Even when the enemy came and tried to take me out, whether you used them or not, but you, but you said the victims, the victims will become the victors. Mm, hallelujah, somebody. The plunder will become the plunderers. Mm, the defeated will become will be the defeater. <laughs> the defeated will defeat. And the powerless will become the powerful. Mm. Let's look at this term, creditors. Creditors. Okay, creditors. It's your creditors, your creditors. Now, these are the people who have survived the plundering. The creditors. All right, or or uh, in the King James says booties unto them, right? The creditors. Um, uh, verse eight, verse eight. Shall they not rise up? Oh, that's verse seven. Verse eight, verse eight. Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of that dwell therein. See, these, the, this verse right here sets the reason for why, right? Right, you got Habakkuk asking, why, Lord? Why, Lord? Why, Lord? This sets the reason right here. How God set his revenge on this great nation that, that the God of wrath he used as an instrument of destruction toward his own people, right? He's letting them know, I'm coming with revenge. Vengeance is mine. Now, when I look at this term here, many nations, in top of verse 8, many nations, you know, these people cause great devastation. You got to remember now, Babylon, they had already taken out Egypt, 
Egypt is a world power. Babylon has taken out Assyria. Assyria is a world power. So you got Babylon to the south, you got uh, Egypt to the east, and then you got Assyria to the north. It's not like these are neighboring powers. No, sir. No, sir. You got to cross some desert. You got to cross some water, potentially, to get to these people. So, I mean, these folks have really uh, have some great tactics on, at warfare. You know, so when you look at this remnant business, remnant, God has allowed the dedicated Jews. He's allowed the faithful Jews to remain uh, and defeat the victor. Men's blood, men's blood. I looked at this here, verse 8. Men's blood, men's blood. Because they have shed this blood, so shall their blood be shed. Violence, violence of the land. Because these people have been so violent, I mean, they were like, they were like scoffers of violence. They were like laughing at the violence that they were committing. They were enjoying it and loving it and reveling in the violence. God says, so shall violence come to you. Verses 9 through 11. Uh, this is your second woe. Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil that has consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people. Let me start that again. Thou has consulted shame to thy people by cutting off many people and has sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Wow. Ooh, that's pretty deep right there. That's pretty deep right there. Now, this second woe or exploitation is rooted in covetousness, right? The Chaldeans promoted themselves and helped themselves to another uh, nation's belonging, right? This is God's chosen people, and they just helped themselves to all of their stuff, right? Now, this is a continuation of verses 6 through 8. The defeated nations can see, they can see the stone and timbered walls from other nations, right? I mean, these stones, God says, the, the stones and wood would speak as a testimony to what has happened. You know, these great and precious stones and fine wood speaks volumes toward the violent plundering that has taken place. You know, I don't know, this is David's thoughts, but, you know, they, they, it may have even been some blood on the stone and wood. You know, I would not be surprised. You know, if you got three million plus, four or five million people there, you know, we know three million plus for sure, and there's a lot of killing going on, I wouldn't be surprised if some blood, uh, some wood on, on, you know, and you might even have Babylon intentionally putting blood on here, bragging about it, Right? Now, in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, God answers Habakkuk's question as to how long that he's going to let this sin continue in Judah. God says, I will work a work in your days, which ye shall not believe. Ooh. He says, though it be told to you, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. God is preparing Babylon. He's, he's raising them up. See, I don't know if this was the reason why it took so long in Habakkuk's eyes for God to address the sin, you know, if he was preparing the Chaldeans, he was raising up Babylon to get them prepared to be the rod, his instrument. But God goes in on in chapter one, he says that they are a bitter and nasty nation. God says this about the Chaldeans, they are bitter and nasty. He goes on to say that they are terrible and dreadful. Wow. But oh, hallelujah, somebody. God has a plan. Mm. God has a plan. Let's go ahead and read verse 9. <clears throat> oh, we read verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. So when I look at verse 9, I see something here. It says that he set 
his nest on high. Set his nest on high. Right? Now, I looked this up. I asked Mr. Google. I said, Mr. Google, what bird builds the highest nest? And it turns out it's the eagle. It's the eagle. The eagle builds the highest nest. Now, Babylon, they feel secure, right? You know, no bird can mess with the eagle. <laughs> eagle is up too high. Your birds can't mess with the eagle. Now, Babylon feels secure in its position, right? They defeated all the other world powers, the Egyptians, the Assyrians. They are the number one world power sitting up high, full of themselves, because the defeated enemies may come for revenge one day. The Chaldeans built their walls so that they were impregnable. They built their walls so they were not able to be breached. So they thought. <laughs> now, in this verse 10, I see in here, it says, you give shame to the council. You give shame counsel. Now, the council of the generals and warlords, warlords lead to the death of other nations, right? right? The Babylonians, uh, the Chaldeans, the leaders, the generals, the lieutenants, they give counsel on how to kill, right? right? It leads to death of other nations, which will lead to the death of their own souls. Mm. God says, because you come up with these great, wild, and wicked tactics of killing, your soul is going to die. See, even the people of the children of Israel who were, who ki were killed in this, in this uh, war right here, many of their souls still went on to be with God because of their faithfulness and dedication, even before Christ. Not all of them were wicked. Not only did these Chaldeans cause violence to many people, but they have caused sin to their own souls, which lead to death. You know, like I know, brothers and sisters, Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, amen. Now, the stone and timber, let's look at that again in verse 11, the stone and timber business. Now, these are witnesses to the bragging of the Chaldeans. Now, in God's court of justice, these items will be sufficient witnesses for the pending destruction. Hmm. Vengeance and punishment to come. Look at this now. God says the rocks will cry out to praise his name, right? Well, in this case, these rocks are crying out as witnesses to the bloodshed that these Chaldeans have enacted on God's holy people. Hmm. Wow. So God's God can make a rock be a witness for his holiness and his righteousness. God can make a dang on piece of wood speak out on his behalf in the court of God's kingdom and say, these people have done wrong and destruction and vengeance and punishment is to come. It's an imminent destruction, an imminent vengeance, imminent punishment that God is going to put on these people. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. Now, verses 12, 13, and 14. This is the third woe. We're going to be done here. The third woe accuses them of being ruthless and of building luxury palaces. It says, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establish a city of iniquity, because it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, just as the water covers the sea. Whoo! Everybody's going to know what God has done to these people. These people, they're building all these luxury palaces, you know, by the means of bloodshed and slave labor. God uses an illustration here that... Uh, that like fire that burns everything in its way, so will his divine punishment burn all that they have built. Ooh-wee! Their labor is in vain, brothers and sisters. <laughs> ah. Last week, two weeks ago in Sunday school class, I had one of the students say, yeah, but why does it look like the wicked 
have all these beautiful things and mansions and cars and money and da 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 Brothers and sisters, say it with me. Their labor is in vain. Now look at this here. It says, buildeth a town with blood. Buildeth a town with blood in verse 12. These Chaldeans built a mighty empire, brothers and sisters. They had marvelous structures at the price of reckless bloodshed and slave labor. Because of this type of behavior, they have sealed their fate. An ultimate doom is on the way. These Chaldeans were sanctioned by God, right? But the tactics, the tactic, tactics used were not approved. Mm. Their vanity brought about great joy. Their vanity brought about great satisfaction and whipping and killing and torturing God's people. Hmm. Verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Field, 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 field. Unlike the temporary glory of the Chaldeans, God tells Habakkuk in this vision that his universal, ooh, hallelujah, his universal glory will inhabit all the earth, that the establishment of his millennial kingdom is on its way. Numbers 14, 21 says, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Psalm 72, 19 says, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Isaiah 6 and 3 says, and one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Lord's earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah 11, 9 says, they shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen, hallelujah somebody. God is in control. And no matter what comes in our lives, no matter what comes our way, God is in control. And if you and if me, we are God's servant, huh? If we are God's servant, he's going to make sure that we win the battle. See, all you got to do is read the end of the book. I don't care what happens in your life. God says we have the battle. All you got to do is look at the beginning of the book. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says, yeah, the enemy's going to bite you on your heel. Yeah, the enemy's going to cause a little pain in your life. We all know that. You live long enough to know there's going to be some pain in your life. But God says he's going to stump that devil's head. He's going to stump that devil's head and he's going to destroy him so that we will have the victory. And God is coming back, brothers and sisters. Jesus, our Savior, he's coming back. He's going to be riding on a white horse. He's going to be dripped in blood. He's going to be dripped in a robe full of blood. And he's going to have chariots, chariots coming down, chariots of fire. Angels are going to have arrows of fire. And he's going to whip the devil and all his imp. And he's going to reign for a thousand years. It's called the millennium reign. God's kingdom is coming back. Just hold on. Hold fast to God's unchanging hand. He promised us, he promised us that we already have the victory. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Don't let nothing put you down. You have the victory in God. Mm, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This concludes our lesson, brothers and sisters. Mm, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This concludes our lesson. I must say thank you to our sponsors, uh, New York Fried Chicken. And, whoo, oh, thank you, God. And great, great, great giant supermarket. I must say thank you to them as well. And then I want to say thank you to the Urban Youth Tech Lab. They have been very, very good to us. Uh, Maritza Jr., uh, Boleg, and uh, uh, Jaquante, and Blessed. I want to say thank you to all of you as well. We really appreciate you. 
I'm really taking time with them. I told them the other day, sometimes they really get on my nerves. They test me because, you know, I, I, got, I have eight children, well, 10 total with my wife's two, uh, my new wife's two, but I have 10 children total. And I tell you, my grace uh, has slipped away some. <laughs> my mercy for children has slipped away some, but God is building me back up. And I told them, I don't ever want to quit on them. I want to continue to influence their lives. You know, I want them to become very prosperous adults in the kingdom of God so that they can turn around and one day come and meet me and, and say, David, man, Mr. David, Pastor David, you've been great in our lives. And I'm not doing it for a pat on the back. I'm doing it because this is what God is calling me to do. But yes, is it great to have encouragement? Yes, I'm not going to quit on these young folks. I'm going to help build them up along with their parents. All right, enough said. If you're still hanging on and you would like to uh, um, bring an offering to our ministry, God knows we can use it. Uh, what we do is not free. So we would certainly appreciate uh, any help to our ministry. Uh, I'll put the uh, ways that you can donate in the notes. God bless you. Uh, please copy this link and share on your social media pages. I love you very much.